Welcome everybody to Assistive Technology Consideration for the IEP. Today's training is a joint presentation between Parents Helping Parents and EPU. My name is Diana Marr. I am an education specialist or a resource specialist uh, specializing in assistive technology. And I've been at our agency for about 12 years. And I'm really excited to bring to you a great amount of information about how to consider AT in the IEP. We do serve five counties in the, in the Silicon Valley area. Um, so welcome to all those families. And hello, everyone. My name is Nick Lutton. Uh, I'm with EPU Children's Center, Exceptional Parents Unlimited, and uh, I am an education resource specialist uh, out here in the Central Valley, which is in the Fresno location. Uh, we service 11 counties out here, which is pretty large. So between PHP and EPU, we're covering about half the state, which is fantastic. Um, and we're just so excited to be able to be doing this collaboration with uh, parents helping parents because AT is so important. And all of us within our Family Resource Center, as well as our PTI program, have children or loved ones with disabilities. Uh, and I have a nine-year-old son with ASD and ID, and he uses a AAC device. So this is near and dear to my heart. And then I have a three-year, and he's a regional center client, and I have a three-year-old who's a regional center client as well. So we're very excited and we're very thankful to be joining PHP tonight. All right. So today's learning objectives in regards to what it is that we're going to be doing. Um, and this is a lot of information. So just FYI, we're absolutely going to answer questions in the chat, but it's definitely a lot of information. We want to increase the understanding of what assistive technology is, uh, the process and the appropriate AT consideration within the IEP team, um, an AT assessment. When should it happen? Um, the AT documentation within an IEP, when should that happen and how should it be? And parent involvement uh, opportunities that we have and so much more. We can go on to the next slide. So in this portion, we're gonna do it, as you can see, we have multiple areas we're looking at, but AT consideration, we're gonna define assistive technology um, throughout this, and we're gonna move on to the next ones. Um, but defining assistive technology is going to be the first. All right. And so what is assistive technology? One of the things that I know uh, when we see parents, we have uh, we hear many different things. And so if you would like, if you'd like to in the chat, just type in what you think assistive technology is for your child or just in general. Um, again, looking at it from an outside perspective, we wanna teach you as much as possible, but we always like to hear what the parent's perspective is on what AT actually is for them. Um, so specifically in regards to an AT device, you see on here the actual code, which is any, any item, piece of equipment um, or product system, whether acquired or commercially off the shelf, modified or customized, um, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of the child with a disability. An AT service is any service that directly assists an individual with a disability. Um, in the selection acquisition or the use of that assistive technology device. Um, and again, a device is basically anything that helps a person to do something that they couldn't do because of their disability. It helps compensate um, for the capitalization on any type of strengths or weaknesses that there might be. It does not include anything like cochlear implants, so medical and things of that nature, um, but, Included in the IEP, uh, any tech, even low tech, small items, coloring cups, things of that nature should be included and it could be continued from year to year. Uh, and when it comes to the service, the AT service, um, we're looking at the assessment, training, the implementation timelines, meeting dates, and making sure that things like this are, you know, they can be life changing, but at the same time, we want to make sure that everything is all set up and ready to go uh, when it comes to all of this. And so again, looking at the assistive technology in general, in general, um, we're gonna look at the evaluation portion 
Oh, it's okay. You can go to the next one. So what is assistive technology? Um, so consideration of assistive technology does not only include the device itself, but the consideration and implementation of assistive technology should also be included in the discussion of AT services. So AT services in their generalized sense, you have the evaluations of the need of a child, including the functional evaluation of a child um, in their customary environment. So in their natural environment, right? So we're looking at a child in their natural environment, the acquisition of assistive technology. Again, what type of assistive technology are we getting? How are we receiving it? Selecting and designing and fitting and customizing, adapting, applying, maintaining, repairing, and replacing. That's so much to take in. So much information to take in, right? Maintaining and repairing is so huge and replacing is something that we hear about all the time when it comes to assistive technology. And we're going to talk about that in regards to the school's responsibility. Coordinating therapies and interventions or services um, with AT use, again, being collaborative. Uh, training or technical assistance for the student. Again, something that is so imperative, uh, but is something that, again, we have to make sure is done correctly. And at the same time, one of the biggest ones is training and technical assistance for professionals, employers, or others. And that's something that we absolutely are going to touch on because for enable for the student to be able to maintain and use this effectively, the people who are familiar users of that student around them need to understand what this AT does and how it affects the child. And so it's something that we're going to be looking at. So oftentimes IEPs focus their efforts on identification and documentation of required assistive technology devices. But what they fail to address is services such as training and technical assistance, like I talked about, um, which are again, critical to the student's success. Um, IEP, IEP teams must acknowledge um, as much as possible the, the potential assistive technology can give to a child. So training for the service in its basic sense, should be for the student, the student's family, any professionals, that includes teachers, specialists, one-on-one -on -one aides, and also other people involved with the student. And that's one that, again, if you have, um, you know, if you have a child that is, say, in, um, in not grammar school, but in going into high school, they have multiple teachers, right, with multiple aides in different classrooms, and they're going from spot to spot. Um, that's something that we have to look at because it can't just be one centralized person. It needs to be anyone who's involved with the student. Um, and the school must provide adequate training in order to ensure that proper and full understanding of the device is there, not only for the student, but for the parents, the teachers, and anyone involved with that student. So this is one of my favorite slides here. Um, and I love this because we have all of these fun things in my house and I know we have them at EPU and I know PHP has them. And in assistive technology, right, it's any object, device or tool that makes uh, life easier, okay? If you wanna just break it down to that. And so we have things from no tech all the way up to high tech. And you might see a correlation with things as we get higher and higher and higher up to high tech. You might see a correlation with cost and, you know, that looks intensive. And most people, when they think assistive technology, they think of, you know, iPads with specific programs on it or text to speech and things like that. Assistive technology is anything that assists a child. So, again, you have low tech, such as, you know, pencil grips, um, tech systems, which we have on here, which are communication boards. Um, we also have, you know, tablets that have communication applications, not just uh, word speaking devices, things that actually where you can put sentences together. And then again, digitalized PEC systems that can help families move on uh, with the child's needs in regards to communication or assisting them in accessing their education. Um, and again, it'll be part of that continuum. So you see it's a wide range of, of things. And this is just a small bit of it, but 
um, it's a good, it's a really cool graph because we just get to see everything that we see normally on a day-to-day -day basis, but it doesn't mean that this is a comprehensive list. There are hundreds of things that are considered assistive technology. So AT can address any of these areas that we see. Um, academic learning, daily living, um, pre-vocational and vocational, which is huge for our, ch our children who are going in, uh, to IEPs for transition into maybe an adult transition program or working with the Department of Rehabilitation. Um, any visual aids, uh, mobility aids, things of that nature. Again, not a comprehensive list, but as you see it, again, we're looking at that low tech to mid tech to high tech. So again, low tech, I think the, the base of it is always like a pencil grip because that's something that's, you know, we all talk about. And then you have your PEX boards as well, uh, picture boards. Talking switches are fantastic for students because they can be programmed for specific types of responses. So first then this, that. Um, Pro, portable word processors if they need it, um, alternate keyboards, adaptive mouse, which is great. Any type of text reader, text to speech is unbelievable now. Everyone has that on their phone, if you really think about it. Um, and then specialized support software, which could be a multitude of things. There's Proloquo to go. Uh, that's one of the ones that comes to mind, but there's hundreds of different apps. And then there's speech generating devices that are specific just for that. Uh, just for that. And so there's nothing else on there. Um, and moving on from that, we're going to look at what tools um, are available to help students learn. And so again, so what technology tools are available to help students learn? Well, again, this covers a gamut of information, but how can it help? It can help with social skills. It can absolutely help with writing, any communication, math, reading, vision and hearing, uh, computer access. When you look at these things and you think about your child or you think about just in general in your own life, what assistive technology do you use that helps you access your daily life, that makes your life a little bit easier, right? All of these areas can be improved if they're used correctly and the proper training is given. And that's one of the things that we're here to talk about uh, tonight. Instructional versus assistive technology. This is like, out of all the things that we're gonna talk about, this is something that I love because this is something that when we get calls from parents, it's very difficult to understand. Now, classroom IT, may be available and used by any student in the classroom. So classroom IT, if you look at things just in a, in a general sense, um, you might have an IEP meeting or you might have a meeting where it says, well, we already have iPads in the classroom. We already have the speech to text in the classroom. And we have, you know, all of these other um, IT things in here. And that's any piece of a technology that, educate, that educators integrate into their um, instructional practice. And it's to engage students in their learning. So it's for the entire class, right? To be able to access these things to amplify their learning. Um, when it comes to assistive technology, right, an item becomes AT when it's written into an IEP or a 504 plan. And that's one of the biggest differences that we see when we're talking to parents that have IEPs or 504s. A school or uh, organization might say, we have that available to them at any time. Well, that's available to them and anyone else. When AT, it becomes AT, is when it's put into an IEP or a 504 plan. And then it's specifically for your child to be able to access their education. And as we go through these circles, which is so great because it's an unbelievable chart of how you can kind of compare these two, the diagram illustrates what we're explaining already. So the red circle shows the educational technology that's available to all students, right? So we see this, we have Chromebooks and especially with um, distance learning and how we had that. Now we have you know, Chromebooks, we have apps, we have ta uh, tablets and software and clip art and things of that nature. Um, and so that's all fantastic. And that's available to every single student. So you're looking at IT there, right? That's all IT because that's available to anyone. And then when you move on to the next circle, you're looking for assistive technology, right? 
And there are places where they overlap. Those apps and the Chromebook and things like that can absolutely overlap. But then when we look to assistive technology, again, we just talked about how it relates to your IEP and your 504, the text-to-speech, speech-to-text program, um, e-text, word prediction programs that are specialized for your student to be able to access their education. So again, students with disabilities have AT, all the other students have IT, which your student is available to have, and you see how they overlap. But in general, you're looking, when you're seeing AT, that's specific for your child and their progress for their access of their education. So on this slide, we talk about what's called UDL, which is the Universal Design for Learning. Um, it's a set of principles uh, for designing curriculum that provides all individuals, including those with learning differences, uh, with equal opportunities to learn. Uh, the principles call for a varied and flexible ways to present um, or access information, um, concepts and ideas, things of, you know, the what of learning, if you'd like to say that. Um, that helps plan and execute learning tasks. And what it does is it gets people engaged and stay engaged in learning. And as we've seen, some of us have and some of us haven't, especially with in per, or not in-person, but um, distance learning, a lot of our students were disengaged. If you go into the new classrooms, you see that there's technology everywhere. And it's there specifically because looking at the Assistive Technology Act, which is part of a uh, law that Congress passed, it shows that using these systems actually help not only make sure that children are interactive, but it helps grow the entire classroom together um, when it comes to universal design of learning. So it's the curriculum that's based on it and it's unbelievable uh, that it's now here and more technology is being added into the classroom. So when we talk about it and there's a great guide to it, which again, you'll get in the, uh, in the handouts, but the universal design for learning is there again, to help all students within the classroom, even those with learning disabilities, so that they can be actively engaged in their education. So next we're gonna talk about effective consideration process and how that works. Uh, we'll be just focusing on that. And again, the effective consideration process is assistive technology is within IDEA and the Tech Act. IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, where all of our IEPs come from. That's the law. Um, and the Tech Act, which, again, I just spoke about in regards to integrating everything. The IEP team and AT consideration, um, assistive technology assessment, when are we going to do it? And then the forms and documenting AT, which, again, we're going to go over as we go. So... AT consideration, what does it mean? Um, so one of the things, this is, and what the law says about it, and this is one of the things that I kind of relate back to something that we talk about during our IEP trainings, which is appropriate, right? How is appropriate defined? Well, how, what does consideration mean? To consider means to think carefully and examine uh, thoughtfully um, and come to an informed conclusion to develop an informed opinion. So by requiring the consideration, of a student's possible need for assistive technology, um, it's mandated in IDEA that everything be there for the student's benefit and that we consider these things so that we are actively participating. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that in order to give proper consideration, um, to the possibility of AT by a student with a disability, the members of the IEP team collectively must have enough information and knowledge to make appropriate decisions based on this. So again, how are we going to consider it? We wanna have continuous and careful thought. And we also, the, the matter weighed in and take into account when formulating an opinion that everyone understands and why are we doing it? Because it's mandated by law. So in regards to school age children, uh, and we talked a little about IDEA, which again, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, in developing each child's IEP, the IE team must consider whether a child needs assistive technology devices or services. It is a non-starter on every single one of your IEPs. And I know uh, that Diana will touch on this. There's a box and it has to be considered no matter what. Now, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and some of our children might have 504s, 
Uh, students on 504 plan may also be entitled to AT as a reasonable accommodation. And so it's not just for uh, our children with IEPs, it can also be for our children who have 504 plans. But we have to define the two differences in regards to things, because in an IDEA, if you have an IEP, it must be considered. It's something that's an absolute must. With a 504 plan, they might be entitled to it, but we have to talk a little bit more about that. So what can we infer from the process, kind of how I started off to the, you know, from the beginning to now, um, and what do parents need to know? So there is no eligibility criteria for assistive technology. And one of the previous trainings that I've done with PHP, um, they said something fantastic, which I love, which is if the child's breathing, they can have AT. And I love that. And I use that with my parents all the time. Um, consideration for AT is not merely a checkbox on the IEP. It's a process that requires conversation and review and observation and a whole bunch of team input. Consideration should also be an ongoing process that's revisited at any time. And anytime that there's a concern, it should be revisited just like we have it with our regular IEP meetings. And then making sure that when we're documenting the need for AT in a student's IEP, additional information should also be put in. Um, and what that does is, is it involves any training that might be necessary, like we talked about who should be trained, um, where it will be, where that AT device will be, how long will it be with the child, what will they use it for, and again, how are all the team members going to be, um, how are they going to be trained on it. And the school district just, again, is not required to provide a student with the best or the highest technology available, but technology that provides some meaningful educational benefit. And again, we go back to, the, to what's appropriate, right? Within our IDEA law, what's appropriate. So what should we expect? It's a brief process and a short discussion, depending upon, that's what we should expect in most of our IEPs, unless we've come to a consensus that this is what the child needs. It needs to take place during the IEP meeting, and it happens after the goals have been developed or reviewed, and it is a team decision. So again, as a parent, you have to remember you're the most important part of that team, and we want to make sure that your voice is heard. which moves me right on into the next one, which is a collaborative team effort, which is what I love because I know EPU and PHP both preach this in a big way, that a collaborative effort with our school team is the best way to go ahead and help out not only our school, our children, but just for our sanity. Um, the collective wisdom of the group um, is so important because again, we have the students, parents, teachers, related service providers. So if you have anyone from outside that's coming in on your IEP team, like your ABA therapist, uh, occupational therapist, speech and language pathologist, and the AT specialist, and a combination of all these people can be there. And their collective wisdom should be able to be put together so that the understanding is made if this child needs assistive technology. Um, and again, depending upon the expertise of the team, um, they may seek services of an AT specialist, and they do have those at the school sites, and they provide device category expertise in regards to certain applications, resources, they know district policies and procedures, ideas, and training and troubleshooting. But one of the things that, again, we want to drive in is that most of the team members come and go, and that's going to happen. But we remain the same as parents. So we're the longest lasting member of a child's IEP team. And not only when school is done, we come back home and we still have to use these AT devices if they are given to our children. So we have the most insight, but it is a team and a collaborative effort. So listen to the people on your team. You can respectfully disagree, but at the same time, you could also come together to make an unbelievable team and make everyone's life so much easier. And I just, I love, I love this slide. So who pays for it? That's one of the things that I hear all the time. So who funds AT in the school setting? Well, the LEA does. And as you've seen, I use a lot of acronyms and uh, I'll do the same thing. The LEA is the local education agency is responsible for providing AT services um, if the IEP determines that it's necessary. Um, and again, it's necessary for FAPE, which is the free and appropriate public education, which is a core principle of, the, of IDEA. Um, it may maintain um, the student in, a, in the least restrictive environment, again, the LRE, which is another core principle, and it may provide meaningful access to the general curriculum. 
Um, now, what about home use, right? So one of the things that we want to get across is that just in general, right? Who pays for it? The school pays for it. What about home use? If the school and the IEP team decides that it needs to be done at home for the child to receive their free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment, school also takes responsibility for that. Um, can cost be a factor in determining appropriate AT? No. Um, one of the things that we hear all the time as uh, advocates is that sometimes the schools will say, well, we don't have uh, the funding for that. The funding does not make a difference when it comes to these things. If the IET deems it appropriate, it is something that needs to happen. So again, remember that when we're talking with our team collaboratively, that cost is not a factor because again, you're not paying for it as a parent, but at the same time, it's not something that could be used against utilizing this program or AT devices if they would like, if the IEP decides that it would be beneficial for the child to access their education. All right, thanks, Nick. That was uh, amazing. Um, so much good information about what, what a parent's are, rights are, and now let's move into the process. Um, and how do we go through this consideration process? So um, sometimes families feel like, well, I have no idea how it's supposed to move forward. Um, I have no idea what to expect. So the good news is that there are grassroots efforts to create that have created forms, documents to help families and even school teams understand what is the expectation and to they've developed best practices. And so Kiat, Q-I-A-T, um, their website is listed below. They have a, meant a lot of different resources there that both professionals and families alike can go there and um, gain knowledge um, from which to base their decisions. They can um, ha find lists of different types of devices, and we'll be going through this as well, and um, and understand what makes a well-defined process. You know, what do we talk about first, next, and then later? Uh, and then what do we base decisions on? You know, where do we find this data? Um, how do we shape these goals? And of course, how do we document it in the IEP? So let's move through kind of this thought process of how do we consider AT? And so we've broken it down here into three steps of consideration. So if imagine a student that is just um, having their annual IEP, they're struggling, maybe the same goal is appearing year to year. And so the team now is looking at the goals, their learning environment, and they're trying to decide, are we going to use the same goals? Are we going to add any goals? Do we need to break the goal down a little bit more? Uh, what else can we be trying? Um, and so they're having that discussion. Um, maybe they're, next they're determining the student's level of difficulty with specific tasks. So maybe by the end of fourth grade, they're still not quite able to read with fluency. Um, a, a gap in their literacy is, is getting larger. And so we definitely see this level of difficulty um, uh, rising to that, that, that rising bar is becoming more and more difficult, fourth, fifth, and as the grades are moving on. And so the team has to, um, at that point, figure out, well, what we're providing, maybe it's not all working. You know, do we need to be considering AT? Have we considered AT in the past? Um, hopefully that's yes, if the child is on an IEP. And maybe this year is the year that we need to really dig deep. And so let's look at four possible outcomes of this consideration. So with this, so here's our little hand with four fingers. One outcome could be no, you know, 
we've, you know, we actually don't see this gap increasing. We do see her making progress in her goals. We do see her um, being able to keep up with the learning of her peers. And we are not considering a restrictive environment for placement. And so, no, I think she's doing just fine. But maybe they're thinking, you know, you know, she's been using this uh, 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 picture icons and it's been working for her communication. And so we're going to continue that. So we know some AT, um, she's already using it. It's going well and we're going to continue it. So that would be yes. There's a second yes though. What if it's yes, she needs AT, but she needs a higher level at AT. And so somebody on the team says, you know what? I have this um, iPad that's got another higher level AAC. So if she's done with her Go Talk, maybe we move to ProLoquo to Go and she's using the iPad to try. If everybody agrees, then it's yes. We know of uh, that we agree that she needs AT. We know of some options and we're willing to try it. Okay, so we have no, yes, yes. And so the fourth option is, gosh, everybody's looking around the table and thinking AT, what is this? What, what do we mean consider AT? And what, what could be we be using for the next level? All we know is, is um, you know, we've heard the term, <laughs> but we really don't know. Right? And so for teams that are trying to move through that process, hopefully they have some sort of scaffolding to help them guide through this thinking process. So this is just one of these um, choice charts. So it starts with, does a student need AT? Yes or no. If, if uh, or is a student currently using AT? No. And then if yes. But the one that I wanted to point out that is here is the I don't know category, because if it is I don't know, it might lead the team to considering requesting an AT assessment. Okay, and so essentially this summarizes the consideration process. Like Nick mentioned, it happens during an IEP meeting. It doesn't have to go from meeting to meeting to meeting, multiple meetings. It's a casual conversation. Everybody brings their knowledge of the student and knowledge of what they've been using um, in the AT realm and they contribute it into the discussion. Now, if the, if the answers were the, either of the no, um, yes, the first yes or the second yes, then you have enough information just from that simple consideration discussion to fill out this section on the special factors page of the IEP. And then on the special factors page of the IEP, there's a certain portion that mentions assistive technology. So you'll have to look in your IEP documents for a page that says special factors at the top and see if you can find the term assistive technology. And that's the area where you would find a box for no. If it's no, the child's doing great and doesn't need AT. Or if it's yes, the first type that we know the AT or yes, the second type we know of the AT and we're willing to try it, then this box can be checked and then the team would clearly describe it here as much as possible. So this would be one place to get started with documenting the AT here, but it's certainly not the only place. You know, in different areas, especially in the state of California, if you're in Fresno um, and the county is around there, if you're in the Monterey County, uh, you're your documents might look different than the Santa Clara County samples, but of course you, I would direct you again to look for the special factors page, again special factors page on your IEP document, and look again for the assistive, um, anywhere it says assistive, this one says assistive augmentative devices or tools, and then there's a no a yes box and a place to describe. So that's where you would find it and document the outcome of your consideration. 
right? We're not going to go into the I don't know section yet because we'll have another uh, section where we talk about that in just a bit. So teens might be thinking, well, it sounds good. You're saying we just get together, we meet, and we have this discussion. So how do I know that I'm doing it right? Am I doing it right? And so we can see here that there are several places you can go to for these types of resources. There are forms that we refer to as the SETT set forms that were developed by Joy Zamala, which sadly she has recently passed away. Um, but you know, she has generously devoted herself to this and has given this form and framework freely to the special needs community. So um, her, her legacy lives on in, in her sharing. Um, there's the Quiat documents here. Wadi also has a lot of uh, documents there that you can look at their best practices that have sheets to guide you through the consideration um, under their publications tab. Uh, and the Georgia Project for Assistive Technology also has a quite robust uh, selection of guidance as well as forms for individuals to take and use. And it doesn't matter if it comes from a different state because all that we're looking for is how do we guide the discussion. So when we see um, the prompt here, it says student, we know to fill in the student's name here. We fill in the case manager and other information. But most, most importantly, we see down here, it says, what are the student's strengths and learning barriers? What are the classes and situations where help is needed? And that's under environment. Under tasks, it says, what are the tasks that the student needs to be able to accomplish to meet IEP goals? So the team would be prompted here and fill this out. And then lastly, we have the discussion about tools. What tools are you already using? What tools or strategies do you have questions about? So already using, this, this could include instructional technology that you've pulled in and say, you know what? This student uses this pencil grip all the time. I think the student could benefit by taking this from class to class. The student doesn't have access to this pencil grip in art class or in history class. So what if we write this specific pencil grip under this tools for as a learning barrier, maybe it's the writing and environment. We would list all the different environments, including perhaps art and history and anywhere else they might need to be using um, a writing implement with that pencil grip. And the specific task, let's be clear here. So when the teacher or aide is trying to support the student, they know exactly what types of tasks they can expect to ensure the student has access to their AT. Let's look at one more form. This one is from GPAT, GPAT, Georgia Project for Assistive Technology. This is specifically their AT process guide. And it has a lot more words. And I apologize, that's a little bit blurry, but we had to kind of increase the size and it was printed quite small. But of course, you'll have these documents with the links and get to the original document, which will be nice and clear for you. But for example, in these check boxes, we have all different subject matters from writing and studying to spelling, um, oral communication, seating and positioning, mobility boxes, daily living boxes, recreation. So we would check as a team any of these boxes where the student needs any support in. And then so we continue to move through these prompts, guiding our team through this discussion of uh, classroom materials currently used. What are accommodations and modifications currently being used? And AT that are currently being used. And then other possible solutions that the team has identified, such as accommodations, modifications, strategies, AT devices or services. And so those would then be listed in the corresponding columns here. 
and this form in particular has a backside that you would just continue filling out for the child and at the end these check boxes would then be does a child need a t no yes yes or you know there's the i don't know what what else do we need to investigate what else do we need to do this is just one more it's just a different form factor pretty similar questions and prompts to guide your team through so all of these are the prompts uh, the academic area is written here on the side, and then the team would then go through this form and fill it out for that child. And so you might be thinking, you know, this last column where it says um, possible AT solutions and devices, we're, I can see my team right now. We're just going to look around the table and we have no idea, right? What do we do for the child who is having trouble taking notes um, or um, you know, writing things down with dictation, um, organizing themselves. Well, here, this document, again, from um, the GPAT collection, Georgia Department of Education website, uh, they have an assistive technology consideration resource guide. And on it, you'll see a column that has instructional tasks listed here such as, can they write their name, copy information, write legibly, take notes, can they graph, use appropriate spelling. And then there are classroom materials that are available, um, accommodations and modification suggestions, and then on the far right column, assistive technology solution. These are the AT ideas. So the child might benefit from using a pencil grip, adapted paper, positioning aids, some non-slip material so they can, you know, stabilize themselves while they're writing. Uh, perhaps use a dry erase board. There are all kinds of suggestions here and they're correlated to these sample instructional tasks. And this document in real life is many pages long. So it will move through all kinds of curriculum areas, um, uh, even physical motor tasks, things like that, and then give lots of suggestions of assistive technology solutions. So that's something that your team could do a little bit of research and bring to the team to add to the consideration discussion. So maybe in this example, your team didn't finish the discussion, but somebody remembered, you know what? You know, EPU and PHP shared with me, there's some sort of resource guide out there. Let's table the discussion for another IEP meeting. Let's get another IEP meeting on the books and let's talk about AT solutions then, because I'm gonna bring that list. It had all kinds of tie-ins tie to different academic and functional areas. Or, Perhaps somebody on your team says, you know what? I heard about this online survey that we could do. We could, I could sit with the student and in 15 or 20 minutes, they'll enter their information in there and um, type in their challenges and then out comes a little summary report. And this summary report talks about behavioral mitigations what types of AT can be used to support behavior. Perhaps behavior is a result of communication challenges. Uh, maybe it's that the sensory wise, the auditory sensory input is upsetting to them and triggering behavior. So we need ways to use um, headsets to block the noise and reduce that sensory stimulus. So noise reduction. Um, perhaps they need calming cards, a visual prompt for them to be reminded of how they can go through a calming uh, set of steps. So these are all considered different types of AT tools that could be used to support behavior for this particular student. So this is a free little exercise that somebody could do. And again, it may require the team have a second conversation once they've gone through this exercise with the student and had a, a conversation later. 
So then the AT, uh, in the AT consideration process, the team might ask these questions. Is there reasonable progress towards their goals? Do they think the student's going to achieve their goal by the next, by the close of the IEP, by the annual meeting? Does the goal require tasks or capabilities that are difficult or impossible for the student? Is the student as independent as he can be as he works towards goals? So certainly AT can be used to help scaffold this student as they're working towards becoming more and more independent. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of, of some students um, who may be needing some AT. The team has sat down and considered AT and now is considering writing into the IEP. And so here's John, he's in fifth grade. He has executive functioning and working memory challenges. And so the team has decided to use some graphic organizer software used loaded on his computer and offer him a digital word bank he could use to, you know, because his memory is impaired, he could use his digital word bank and then pull in these terms, plug them into a graphic organizing software on the computer that he already has um, written in, or maybe this is part of his instructional technology. And now the team is considering writing it into the goal in this manner. And notice there are no name brands of any of the things. They're listed here by the category or type of AT that could be pulled in for the student. This way, if anything becomes um, unavailable, that there is a comparable product there and the team doesn't have to rewrite the goal in that circumstance. So here, John will use a computer with graphic organizing software and digital word bank to write a fifth grade level paragraph with an opening topic, three supporting detail sentences, and a closing sentence by the end of the first semester. Okay. So that's an example of writing the AT into a goal. Let's look at another example. This is Sarah. She's in ninth grade. She's nonverbal and has developmental delays. So after the team who is informed about all, all the ins and outs of Sarah's needs, and they've decided that, uh, that Sarah will produce, is ready to, for a more ambitious goal using her existing dynamic display communication device. That's her AAC device, communication device. So they're ready to kind of push her to the next social and communication level using her AT. So this goal says Sarah will produce two to five word sentences or phrases using her dynamic display communication device to participate in a three turn conversational exchange with a peer at least three times a day by the end of the first semester. So I really like that this is written as conversations with the peer because that is the goal. Adults, we really know how to scaffold and support conversations and sometimes we can support too much. And the true sign of success of uh, communication is when students can communicate peer to peer. So I especially like this type of goal when, and it really shows that Sarah is quite successful with her AAC device, her communication device, and she's ready for this next level of communication with a peer. And so um, here you can see that um, these are just some pointers that AT is not written as the goal, right? We didn't say that John is going to be using uh, the graphic organizers and that's the goal, right? It was an academic goal where he is using the AT to compose an essay or paragraph, right? And Sarah is trying to work on her peer-to-peer her -peer communication with her AT. It's not that she's using the AT. So the AT is not the goal. 
The functional or academic goal has the type of AT written in it. So that's what we like to see from a team. Okay, and just some other areas where you might be documenting the AT and the IEP. So this is an example of a communication device. And you might write it into the annual goals or objectives. So maybe using a voice generating device for communication, Sarah will say hello and blah, 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 right? And under related services, we also can add the AT here and describe it as Sarah and their parents will be trained by the AT consultant in the use of the communication device, AAC device. Right? So the parents are getting that training, that support, that service that we talked about was essential in successful AT implementation. So getting that service written in is super, super important. And here under supplemental services and supports, Sarah will have access to their AAC device in structured and unstructured environments. So these are just some examples of where else might you write in the AT in the IEP. And then this one, I'm just going to let you explore this link when you get it, but it talks about collecting the data. Um, and we're going to go through some of some of the, um, the forms in just a bit too. So deciding which AT is a correct one to try. Um, so remember, this is a team decision. Everybody here comes with knowledge about the student and needs to work as a team, sharing their instincts of what would work, what they imagine would work, where they might expect resistance. And so all that sharing, all that data collecting helps the team understand how to best document and implement the AT, right? And so knowing what they know about the student, they could go through these reference documents and pick out the ones they think would be the ones to start trying first or start trying next as a next level uh, or, you know, push or adding AT. Maybe we're looking to add more AT because the ones have been that we've currently tried have been launched really successfully, but we still see other areas where AT could be pulled in to support more learning areas. Okay. Um, that the team is, is in this decision process focusing on the needs and goals, um, finding knowledgeable recommendations, even if it's from a printout, you know, that has a lot of great knowledge in it. So don't discount that as a knowledgeable recommendation. Different sources of AT and follow best practice principles. Okay, so let's talk more about these best practice principles. So one best practice is to do a trial use of the AT and you would document it in, an, in a um, sheet like this that you would add into the IEP and so this is the one from Wadi. And of course, you just write, uh, describe the AT. How long are we going to trial it? Is it two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? And then when are we going to look at the results as a team and decide are we going to implement this as something beyond a trial use? Or do we need to trial something else? Maybe we, the data comes back and it shows us that, you know, it's not working so well for John. And, and you know, for whatever reason, it's not, it's not working. And so the team says, oh, we forgot to support the teacher and train the teacher how to use the graphic organizer because John has it all in his computer, but nobody's showing him how to get it out and when to use it and how to pull up the word bank. And so maybe the team after the trial has discovered, oh, the data shows John's not using his graphic organizers. What's missing? Oh, the training. Let's write in training and let's give it another three weeks and then let's meet back again. So that's how we can use a trial use form. There are other forms. This is just another form factor of it. 
If you're considering apps, there are some very specific to app consideration um, trials, and then it would describe it here. So these, you know, you don't have to make anything. All of these forms are out there waiting for you to just grab and go with your team. And so earlier we mentioned some areas where you could document AT in the IEP, but there are also more areas, right? When you're talking about the present levels of performance, you could pull in the AT because if the student has been using the AT, we certainly want to consider that in how we're describing their functional levels and um, document that in there. Um, and so all of these areas. And pay attention to here, if your child is taking statewide testing and needs a digitized text and a text-to-speech reader where they're listening to a digitized voice or um, a something's reading the text to them, if they're taking a standardized test, then is that written into the IEP? Have the proper forms been filed? Has the person who needs to facilitate that documentation and getting it to the right people at the state level um, to, so the accommodation is approved for the statewide testing? Has that person been tasked with it? And all of that can be written into the IEP. Okay. Even for SAT testing, a student can have accommodations for AT written into it. Okay, and so work with your school team. There are people at the school that are very knowledgeable about how to get these AT items approved for statewide, district-wide testing. Okay. And so earlier we alluded to documenting the training requirements and needs for the staff supporting the student. So look for that page and fill that in. And now we're going to talk about that last one. What if nobody on your team knows about anything about AT and their blank looks going all around the table and clearly the team needs more information? What do we do? Well, here are some resources and you can certainly bring this to your team and share this with them. Anything that we've brought presented here tonight, you can bring it to your team and maybe that will take them away from the I don't know category. Maybe it's just enough information to get them to this, yes, let's try this. Oh, that's right, so-and-so mentioned to me, we do have this in the district. Should we try it? Should I contact them? Should I, I explore it? You know, that might be one of these yeses, right? So if you bring all this data we're sharing with you today, you might be able to convert this I don't know finger into a yes, but let's look into it more or let's, let's do a trial, right? Um, so there are district resources, there are AT specialists in the district, um, like Nick mentioned, there are county resources. So, so if your school district and SELPA doesn't have anything that they seem knowledgeable about, ask them to explore their county resources. Maybe there's an AT specialist there. Uh, maybe there's an AT specialist that's shared among a couple SELPAs. So your SELPA should know who is the AT specialist that they could pull into a school team to consult the team. Um, maybe there's an AT lab somewhere at the county level. Of course, they're the web-based resources and we're sharing a ton with you today. Outside resources, we have here in our area, our iTech Center. Currently, we're not open for families to come into our center for hands-on exploration yet. So we'll see as things continue to open up um, and we'll certainly send a blast out when we are open. But, you know, our state has, um, through our Tech Act, uh, funded a statewide center that should be able to give you information about AT. And this is beyond, also beyond just the school age child. If there are adults or um, you need AT consultation about the workplace um, AT, then contact them and ask your questions to them because they are funded at the federal level to provide this for a statewide. And right now they're based somewhere up near uh, Sacramento, but they serve our whole state. So don't let that location hold you back. 
And of course, Quiat, Q-I-A-T, is listed again here because they have tremendous resources there for all families and professionals to use alike. But if that's still not enough, then you can certainly refer the individual for a full assessment. All right, and so what's the difference between consideration and assessment? I think we know now that consideration is that short discussion. It happens during the IP meeting. We use the known information. Everybody's put their heads together and they're thinking out loud and discussing dynamically. So we're using this known information and then we go through the no, yes, yes, or I don't know, right? And if it is the I don't know still, then we move into this assessment. And this piece, here follows kind of the standard IEP timeline. So the team may be together as decided, yes, we do need to consider AT. Um, and at the conclusion of our consideration, we have decided we don't know. So we need to do an assessment. So we're going to write into the IEP that we are referring this student for an assessment, um, have the parent sign the assessment plan, that activates the 60-day timeline for here in California. And um, the AT assessment is going to result in a detailed report that has, uh, that includes recommendations. It'll look closely at the student's abilities and what challenges that they face, what kind of tasks they're, they're trying to accomplish and they're having difficulty with and it's going to share with the team new information. And so some other times, some other things you might be noticing in your team discussions that might also point to doing an AT assessment is perhaps the student's not making reasonable progress towards their goals and objectives or perhaps the student can't access the curriculum. You know, there's just a barrier there and, you know, there's prompting and all kinds of things, all kinds of support going on, but they're just not able to access their learning. When the student is not as independent as he or she could be, perhaps the team is now suggesting or considering moving to a restrictive placement, a more restrictive placement than the the regular ed classroom. So these are all, you know, good kind of red flags that are waving in the air saying, hey, you know, consider AT and go through your consideration process. And if you don't know what to do, then do an assessment. So all of these might be happening and the team can identify the AT tools or services to meet the student's needs. So. These are all reasons to look into doing the assessment. And I think we covered this already. You know, it follows the standard IEP process of, you know, it's a team decision. Parent, you know, the parent can put it in writing if the team is not specifically uh, come to consensus about the AT assessment and the need for AT. Perhaps the parent says, you know what, in my heart of hearts, I know this is something my child needs. I'm putting in a writing and requesting an AT assessment, right? And then that follows the standard process that we described earlier. And so keep in mind that the AT assessment is not a collaborative process. It might look a little different than the standardized assessments that you've seen coming from the speech therapist or the school psychologist. Perhaps this process it, there are a lot of surveys being given. The students ask a lot of questions. Um, there, there are some classroom observations going on. The parent is being asked some questions, uh, more survey style. And all of this adds to this collaborative process feel. So it shouldn't just be one person swooping in with their cape on saying, hey, I'm here to save your team. And you know, this is, this is what I'm telling you absolutely needs to happen. Right? It still is a collaborative process. And so here are some best practices 
Um, again, I want to emphasize that you're following this clearly defined process, even through the assessment process. There are documents out there. Look at the um, QIAD or WADI. Uh, and I have some resources at the end on one of the later slides that will take you to other other groups that have more best practices. There are lots of groups out there, but just pick one. You know, you don't have to look at all of them. If you just reached into the digital bag and picked one out and said, okay, let's just try this. <laughs> let's follow this process that Wadi has described. They have a lot of good resources. Um, let's try this, you know, and follow their process. So make sure your team is following a process. Um, that there are people that are knowledgeable about the deficit areas. Um, again, that comes back to that team, right? Your school team is involved. Um, and then I think this summarizes a lot of what we said before. And in the looking at the time, I think, I think I'm just going to, you'll get the slide and we're going to move on to the next one. Let's look at what you'll see in the report. You'll see the background information, because um, the person running the report should have reviewed the records for the student, uh, has the reason for the assessment, um, described their procedure, they have interviewed different people, made observations, they've uh, collected data, and then of course they've made their recommendations and hopefully have left you some resources there to investigate further. Right. So there isn't a standardization for AT assessment. Again, it's a lot of surveys, a lot of Q&A uh, interview style. All right, so the implementation, let's look at that. So let's say we've already trialed um, and we've problem solved. We've done a second trial and it's gone really well and we We've met that date at the end of the trial period and we've, we're meeting as an IEP team and we're ready to write this officially into the IEP as a piece. And so here is a sample document you can use. Again, this is part of that structured process being pulled in by the team to document the AT. So um, of course this can be written into different parts of the, of the IEP but when it's summarized concisely here, it really is much easier for the team to review annually. So it has um, the implementation plan of who's involved, the people, their roles, the equipment um, or software, and the status. Do we own it? Do we have to order it? Who's going to order it? Where will it be stored for the summer? Or does a student take it home in the summer? What happens when it needs to be repaired? This thing maybe has to be fitted to the child. And so who's going to modify it to fit it to the child? All of these things have to be described here under the equipment and the tasks and the people responsible and when that person is going to finish with their task. So. These are all very important things to make sure we have a successful implementation. The training is clearly defined here. Classroom implementation. Does it need to be used in the home to address which goals? And how are we monitoring this? Right? What are the instructional strategies that are being pulled in? Things like that. So, all of that is scaffolded out to guide your team through that discussion. So here in Santa Clara County, our CELPA actually has a whole booklet full of resources and guidance for teams to use in their assistive technology implementation. Or this is the implementation form. In their assistive technology uh, consideration and implementation process. So here are some links. I've gone through all the different counties, at least for the counties that we support. For the Fresno people, here's your CELPA page there. And Nick, I'm sorry, I didn't pull in all however many counties for you, but I'm sure that you will be prepared to send whatever AT information that you can pull up and send it to the families that you guys are supporting at EPU for your families. Um, and so we'll have that sent out to you here. So take a look. And again, if you're in down in, you know, Button Willow and you said, Lena, my Selpa down here doesn't have a special booklet like, like Fancy Dancy Santa Clara there, 
you can just take this, right? Again, these things aren't special and unique or owned by Santa Clara County. It can be borrowed and taken and incorporated into your own um, process for your IEP team. You can take it from Georgia. You can take it from anywhere. Wherever you find a document your team likes to use, go ahead and pull it in and use it. Okay. And so... Here are some important reminders. So some of you might be super excited about AT now. It's like, oh my gosh, AT is going to save my child. It's the panacea. It's the oasis that I've been looking for. But consider this, okay? AT does not replace good instruction. So if there's any issue with the instruction quality or things like that, that is not going to... um, Uh, AT is not going to fix that. And it's possible that AT is not the solution, right? Or it's not the solution right now. It might be later. Maybe there are other things. Maybe there's some behavioral mitigations that need to be dealt with first, and then the student might be ready for AT. So it might be something the team still has the AT considered consideration conversation, but maybe not the solution right now. The services have as much or more importance as the technology. So remember, if somebody just chucks something at you and says, okay, make it happen and you'll be successful once you figure it out. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed already. How am I going to figure out how I'm gonna use this, right? And are you going to be successful at implementing all on your own if you're not supported, if people around you aren't modeling, if somebody isn't saying, now's the time to do this, or you're feeling self-conscious because maybe the UDL principles, the universal design of learning, not everybody's using this, so you're feeling self-conscious, right? These are all important things to think about. How are we supporting the needs of the person that will be using the AT? All right, and that service, that support is as much or more important as the technology itself. Okay, dramatic pause because I want that to sink in. The AT should be reevaluated and modified as necessary. So, again, remember earlier I said, oh, um, John is using the the graphic organizers, but it's not successful. Should we just chuck it out the window? Or should the team talk about, are we supporting him properly? Does he have the right services? How is it going with the teacher? All these things can be discussed and and re-evaluated and we can modify the plan so that, oh, we realized we forgot to train the people supporting him. We forgot to show him how to update it because maybe there was a glitch in the software and every time he tries to open it, it says, you need to update this app, otherwise you can't use it. And he forgot to tell someone, right? So he wasn't supported in understanding how to kind of problem solve these types of things. And so there are all kinds of things that when it's not successful, it doesn't mean we just chuck it out. It means we need to have this discussion, maybe reevaluate, rediscuss, reconsider, maybe change it up a little bit, change how the supports are there, and modify the plan as necessary. All right, and that brings us to our resources and parent participation and... So here, let's start with where can you find AT? So you can find it in all kinds of places. Uh, You could help your team by looking around your district and county resources, sometimes exploring the local libraries. Libraries have a tremendous amount of electronic digitized text as well as audio books. Um, And you can talk about different apps that support these types of books and other third party supports that can read it to you um, if you're using electronic text. You can check with Ability Tools. Again, they were up in Sacramento. Uh, Explore software. There are free demos and downloads. Uh, There are light versions that you can use for free before you have to to pay for it. Uh, There are a lot of different kind of apps, so many. Uh, Some are free. There are light versions. 
If there's a very specific device, sometimes you can contact the vendor and ask if you can borrow it before you buy it. That's perhaps less common these days, but you can still check, right? Doesn't hurt to ask. And hopefully once we open up, we have quite a variety of lending items in our library. Uh, you would have to come and pick up the item in person once we announce that we have opened this program back up. We have low-tech reading and writing toolkits, math toolkits, early literacy kits, communication toolkits. We have a communication iPad and sensory kits, and we have more to come. We're going to have a big reveal at the end of summer, so stay tuned for that. Other resources for assessments. Here are some links here. So if you're wanting to investigate that for assessments and other resources here. I know EPU has a lot of resources on their website and we, you can certainly explore their website for those. I just popped a couple of e-packets here about AT consideration and the AT trial period. There are links here that take you directly to some of those form sites. So uh, you'll have that. Um, I have a list of apps, search pages, um, and so all kinds of things here for you. And then here is a real big emphasis from us as parent training centers. Uh, there are so many ways for parents to be actively involved in their child's education. And when parents are more involved, we certainly see that student outcomes improve. And this list here offers many options. So from more simple ones to uh, maybe some local ones here at your school sites, district advisory committees, get involved at your CELPA and school boards. Talk to your county office of education, the state department of education board or the Special Education Advisory Commission. You know, voice at the federal level, write letter to your Congress people. Perhaps get your child involved. Send these people a picture, a personal story of what's working, what's not working. And the reason why is that, you know, your child has their voice, of course. But sometimes, you know, if they're not prepared to go and speak on about what's working and not working for them, you're their voice. As a professional, as a parent, you give these individuals the voice that they need to be heard. And so it, when you're involved, you make that happen. So considering, consider getting involved at any of these levels. There are some articles down here about the benefits of parental involvement. So take a look at those as well. And so let's review today's learning objectives. Nick went through these in the beginning. So I wanted to kind of wrap things up and make sure that you felt like you've got these things under your belt. And when we send out the PDF that you're going to feel like, you know, I got this. And um, so, you have an increased understanding of AT. You have, you understand the process of appropriate AT consideration and that um, when would you uh, conduct the AT assessment and how you document it in the IEP as well as parental involvement opportunities.